Good morning. Uh, today we're we're talking about the the I am saying where Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. I've heard a lot of people talk about um, what does that mean that I am the door and they, they go off on analogies about the door being the entrance, being the first thing you see when you enter, go to someone's house um, and, and all of that. But we're going to look specifically at Jesus' point here. We're looking at John 10, 7 through, uh, 7 through 10, which is a shorter passage, but we're going to read the context in which he speaks. And what's interesting is, this is popping up here. What's interesting is that, and I'll talk about this later, and I am getting ahead of myself. In this statement and in these I am statements, Jesus is confronting the religious leaders of the day. He's not just calling people to him. He's confronting what people believe. There are, uh, well, let's just, let's just move on to the next slide. This is how I would frame what Jesus is saying. There's only one entrance God has provided for people to have eternal, abundant life. The Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah. Only one entrance. Jesus is saying, I am that entrance. I am that entrance. John 10, 7 through 10 is our passage this morning. It's a kind of a short, but we're going to look at the context. Uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll impact specifically uh, what was going on in, at that time. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll look at some deeper meaning. And we'll look at what, what is this faith that Jesus is talking about. This is a relatively short scripture. And... Uh, but it is a high point in Jesus' confrontation of the, the Pharisees, of those people who feel that they are the religious leaders of the Jewish people. They are the gateway into God's kingdom. The law and their interpretation of the law is the gateway into God's kingdom. Jesus is saying, no, nah, I am the gate. I am the gate. The Pharisees were supposed to be the shepherds of God's people. They're supposed to be the shepherds of God's country of God of, of Israel they're supposed to be the shepherds of the law but instead they took the law and they twisted it into some something it was never meant to be and that was they thought we just keep the law and if we keep the law we're going to be accepted that's not what the law is about as we heard last week, the Pharisees were rather upset when Jesus claimed the I am's for himself. Did you know the I am is more than just like Popeye saying, I am that I am? Or it's more than Iron Man saying, I am Iron Man. I am, translated in Hebrew, is Y-H-W-H. Is the word we get, Yahweh, is the actual name of God. And so when Jesus is saying, I am, he's making a very clear claim of who he is. That's why it's so important that we understand. Now, what really got them was his statement in John 8. 58, when he said, most assuredly, listen to me now, 
I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He is clearly, without a doubt, claiming that he and God are one and the same. And so their reaction, they tried to kill him. They picked up stones to kill him. But Jesus, being Jesus and knowing this is not my time, he walked out. And they're like, where'd he go? And next on his, on his way out, he passed by a blind man. And this is his next step in amplifying this conflict with the Pharisees. So he sees this blind man. And Elder Federico last week again spoke about this. Jesus heals this blind man by making a mud with a spit and putting it on his eyes and essentially creating new eyes. Which you would think this is an amazing miracle. And you'd think people would say, you are who you say you are. But no, the Pharisees were stuck in their ritualistic observance because he did this on the Sabbath. The Pharisees held the Sabbath as the dear number one thing to show that you're truly God's person as you kept the Sabbath. And Jesus just broke the Sabbath. On many, many occasions, or a couple of occasions, Jesus flies in the face of this Sabbath-keeping ritual that the Pharisees held so dear. Remember that he's walking through the, the fields one day, and his, peop, his, his disciples are picking, picking food, and they're eating food. And he gets confronted. How, how can you let your disciples work on the Sabbath? And he talks about David going into the temple and taking, taking food. And he makes this statement. He makes this statement. The Sabbath was meant for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant for man so that we would rest, so that we would refresh our relationship with God. Man was not meant for the Sabbath. It was never meant to be a ritualistic means by which that you earn some kind of standing with God. Jesus had a big problem with the way the Pharisees had distorted the law. Because God gave the law to help man live. The Pharisees had taken the law and said, you are now a slave to this law. You have to obey this law in order to live. Um, so as the Pharisees are challenging Jesus about healing, He, this is where we're going to pick it up in, in John 3, 39. He, he makes this statement. Let's pray. Father God, I pray as we go on in your word that you would talk to our hearts, that you would convict us of anything that is, is not right, that, uh, that our, our minds and our desires would be only to serve you. Help me as I present your words. Uh, help, help you to be the center of what is said today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, that's chapter 10, verse 1, but I'm going to go back and start at, at 9, verse 39. Jesus said to them, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be blind, may, may be made blind. This is right after he heals this guy. 
Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words. These are the guys who got it. These are the guys who understood what Jesus was saying. And they said to him, are we blind also? Oh, is that what you're saying? He said, no, no, no. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, now that you say we know the law, we are the per- people, we are God's people, and we are God's leaders on this world to, to help people, then you are guilty. Your sin remains. Verse 1. And he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls, and his own sheep, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Continuing. And when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet, They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus uh, Jesus used this illustration. But they did not understand the things which he spoke. They did not understand the things he spoke. Did you ever have a friend who, who claimed to be a Christian? And you know them, and you know it's just not adding up. Their walk, the things they say, the things they do, how they relate to people, it just doesn't fit their claim of Christianity. Dawn and I manage apartments after... We were married in, in 1991, and that's when we met this guy, Johnny, we'll call him, not his name, but uh, he was one of our tenants, and he quickly became a, a friend of ours, uh, found out he was raised in a Christian home, uh, reading his Bible, claimed to be a Christian, said he was a Christian. We watched him in, as a single man living in our apartments. We watched him meet a girl think he was going to marry she leaves meet another girl gets married we we were through a, we went through a massive earthquake alongside of him we we watched him uh as when his dad died we were with him we watched him um throughout his life and we were there when he got married. Where I was there when he lost his job for stealing money from his job. But he claimed he was a Christian. He had no need to accept Jesus Christ because he had done it already. I know we like to say don't we can't judge. But you know what? When there's no fruit on the tree, you can't claim to be a fruit tree. I hope there are people in here right now who don't say they're a Christian and then go live their life any way they want. That's the Pharisees. Pharisee says we are God's people. We are God's leaders. We lead the Jewish people, don't give us your gospel. Don't give us your story, Jesus. We have it. We're done. My my friend ended up dying literally in the road. His, his, his heart and his, his, his body just gave out after lots of hospital stays and stuff. But he literally, his wife came home one day and 
he was laying in the road dead, and his neighbor was trying to help revive him. I saw him two days, I think, before that. And again, tried to share the gospel with him. But all he could think about and all he could talk about was himself, was his difficulties. He didn't want to hear it. But he was a Christian, right? It broke my heart to see my friend refuse the message because he felt he was already covered. And when you do that, you, you wonder, what, what could I have shared better? What, how could I have talked to him better? How could I live differently to get the point across? But you know what? Sometimes you just can't. Someone who with all their words claim to be a Christian but are not really followers of Christ. That's who we're talking about. I'm, of course, I'm drawing the connection. The Pharisees claim to be the leaders of God's people, but there's no heart. They're not really truly followers of God's promise. They're adherers to the law. Somehow they deceive themselves into thinking that they are God's people, but they're an empty fruit tree. And, you know, I, truthfully, that might be true in this community here. Why do we go to church? One reason we might go to church is so we can be with other people like us. When you're in a foreign country and you don't fit in, you crave to be with people that you can relate to. And I pray if that's you, I pray that if that's the only reason you're here, that you hear the gospel today and God softens your heart and saves you because Jesus is the only door. The Pharisees obeyed all the rules and all the laws, but they were not truly followers of God's plan. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do not, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you haven't accepted your dis disqualified. So they didn't get the story that Jesus told them. So let me, let me break it down. The thief is Gordon Ramsay going into the sheep pen. He's not going in there to save the sheep. He's going in there to find what's on the dinner plate. He's there for his own purposes. And that's the Pharisees. They were there for their own purposes, to raise themselves up. The, the gatekeeper um, is God's promises, God's call on your life. By the way, Matthew 23, 27, Jesus refers to these shepherds of Judaism how does he refer to them? He refers to them as whited sepulchers, which is basically cleaned tombs. They look nice on the outside. They got flowers and, and everything, but inside they're rotting dead bones. That's how Jesus thinks of these Pharisees. The Pharisees were more concerned about their own personal advancement and respect and they were actually caring for the people. And perhaps this illustration that, that Jesus is using, he's calling back to Ezekiel 34, 1 to 2, which says, And the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of, to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. I should not, sorry, should, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And the, the whole chapter 
the whole chapter is about the shepherd who is doing the wrong thing. The, the Pharisees didn't understand, so here we go. So you got Gordon Ramsay, the, guy, the gatekeeper who's watching the gate. Uh, you have the shepherd, uh, and the shepherd goes in, and the sheep know his voice, and they follow him, and they go with him, and they travel with him. And that's the thing. There's what he's saying is that there are true shepherds, and then there's you. You're coming in the wrong way. He's not, this is not the good shepherd. He's not saying I'm the good shepherd. What he's saying is there are true shepherds of Israel. You are not it. The true shepherd will care for the sheep. You're not doing that. See the confrontation he's he's got. Okay, let's get on to our our particular scripture. Oh, that's an Ezekiel one. I spoke about that. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, and he's, he's narrowing, he's focusing it. He's saying, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That is a very encouraging verse for us. Jesus changes it. They don't get it. They don't get that he's saying, you're bad shepherds and there's good shepherds. You're the bad shepherds. They're not getting it. So he's saying, okay, listen, you came in the wrong way. As proper shepherds, you come in through me. If you were great, the right shepherd, you'd be coming in to me, through me. Which just, Jesus claims to be equal with God with these I am statements. He, is, he says that before Abraham was, I am. Which predating himself before Abraham. And now he's saying, I am the only way. I am Basically, he's saying, I am Messiah. No one gets to the Father except through me. See, with this statement saying, I was before Abraham, he's saying, that Messiah you've been looking for ever since uh, Abraham, that faith that Abraham had, that's what I'm calling you to. I am that Messiah that everyone's been looking to from, from, from Abraham forward. The law has been pointing to me. I am the door. I am the only way. Justification, forgiveness has always been through faith. And Jesus is, has always been the focus of that faith. Whether it's, be, I mean, before the cross, it was the promised Messiah, the coming Messiah. God's promises. My, I place my faith on God's promises that he is going to save us. Now, after Christ, is, I place my faith on the work that the Messiah has done, Jesus Christ. And I have hope for the future because of that. Do you have a faith like Abraham? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It, uh, God told him that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, which was like the, the first messianic uh, word to, to Abraham, saying, through you, through your family, everyone's going to be blessed. And what did he say? Cool. I believe you. I'm going to follow you. Let's go. Then he uh, he's married, and God says, you're going to have a son. And through that son, the Messiah is going to come. And through him, the whole world is going to be blessed. And he said, cool, let's do it. I believe you, let's go. Then when he got old, 
too old to have kids. Sarah couldn't have kids. God said, you're still going to have that kid. He said, cool. Let's do it. I believe you. Then when he finally has this miracle child, God says, take him up and sacrifice him. Abraham said, cool. I believe in you, God. I'll do it. Abraham had a faith in God that went beyond common sense sometimes. He just he just knew God was there and he knew God was leading him. And he would live his days speaking to God and he would follow God. Abraham was sold out to God. He's called the father of our faith. He was the first in the line of faith. See Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 11 talks about the hall of faith. And if you're saved, you're one of those who are in the line of faith, in the line of Abraham. Saved based on your faith in God through Jesus Christ. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And I will go in and out and I will find pasture for him. Jesus is not just saying, you're saved, fire insurance, they're gone. And that's how a lot of us think about, a lot of people think about Christianity. I'm saved, I'm good, it's like life insurance, I can live my life. What Jesus is saying is that you enter by me, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He says, I will give you, well, here I got actually I have a slide for that. I'm jumping way ahead of myself, but let's go back to the last verse. The thief does not come except to steal. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Let's jump. So here's a little comparison that Jesus is making. He's saying, I am the door. You Pharisees are thieves and robbers because you didn't come in the right way. He's saying, the sheep don't hear your voice because you're not the shepherd. shepherds. The sheep hear me. And as a result of them hearing me, they are saved. I will always be with them. And they will find pasture, which is peace. They will have peace. My purpose is that they may have life abundantly. Your purpose is to come to steal and to kill and destroy because your purpose is, is all focused on you. As Christians, our focus needs to be completely on Jesus because if it's not, we're following a thief. We're following robbers. Jesus gives us, he, Jesus can save us. He can, he's with us always once he does saves us and he gives us peace. False shepherds, people leading you astray, give you nothing because they're all about promoting themselves. If you replace the Pharisees with today's religions, any religion will fit. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. What's the Bible say? The Bible says in John, says Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In 1 Timothy, Paul says, there's one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. In Acts 4.12, it says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 John 2.23 says, no one who denies the Son has the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father. 
And I can give you verse upon verse upon verse about Jesus Christ being the only way. Perhaps the scariest verse in the Bible comes from the end, towards the end of the Bible, and that's in Revelation 2015. If anyone's name was not written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, it wasn't... It wasn't that the Pharisees disbelieved or didn't believe in the promise of God. They believed that Abraham was their father. They believed in Abraham's life. They believed in God's plan. They just believed that they had the right interpretation of the plan, and they didn't. When the Messiah came, they missed him completely because they didn't know they didn't know the right God. They didn't read the law properly. Jesus is the only door into heaven. The only way. John 33, 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And who he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. It's only natural for us to stumble as Christians and knowingly or or even knowingly step into sin. The difference is does it make you weep? Does your sin cause you grief? If you think, no, I'm good. You know, God covers me. I'm good. Then you're reading a different scripture because the Holy Spirit lives in you and should be convicting you every day of your sin. Should be pulling you back. When it says the wrath of God remains on you, what it's what he's what he's pointing to is the idea of the idea that we're set, we're born into sin. Everyone, we're all sinners. We're all we're all under God's wrath from the moment we're born. It doesn't take a baby long to learn that he can manipulate his mother with certain cries. Right? I say to my my students at school, I say, I can prove to you that you're selfish. What is the first thing that you think of when your mom leaves you home alone and your parents go out? What's the first thing? Is it, what can I do now that my parents are gone that I can't do when they're here? Or husbands, when your wife leaves the house, What is the first thing you think of when your wife leaves the house? What can I do now that my wife is gone that I can't do when she's here? You know, can I get not not what I can get away with? Not it doesn't even have to be sin. Just just the idea that the thought is immediately to yourself, right? Your thought is immediately to yourself, and that is. The very definition of separation from God, that you're it's self or it's God. It's self or it's God. And it's a constant battle for us as believers because the Holy Spirit's constantly calling us back. I've gone long, and I just want to leave you with this. If you're not a sinner, I mean if you're you, we're all sinners. If you're not a Christian, it's very simple. When I, uh, in 1985, when I became a Christian, um, I prayed this prayer. Um, And I, I just said, God, take my life because I feel so out of control. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Please save me. Forgive me for all that I've done. In Jesus' name. And it wasn't, it's not this prayer that saves you, but it's the heart. 
It's the desire to follow Jesus. If you're if you're feeling that I need Jesus today, you can pray that prayer. Can I have everyone bow their heads? And if you want to pray that prayer this morning, just follow after me and uh, mean it and call out to God to save you. This is how we knock on that door. And we ask Jesus to open for us. You say, Jesus, save me from my sin. Save me from myself. God, I am nothing without you. Please forgive me. I want to follow you the rest of my life. Wherever that takes me. However it makes me feel. It's about you and not about the one. Father, I do thank you for being able to share again today. And I, I pray that your spirit worked despite me. I pray that we've, we've all heard and we've been challenged on something. In Jesus' name, amen.